Welcome to, um, so you think you want to be, I want to start your own business. Um, this lecture has come about because uh, today we had uh, a double-decker bus from Startup Britain parked right outside the front of this building and um, a lot of our students were involved in interesting uh, discussions with uh, the entrepreneurs and coaches on the bus and we decided we would run it uh, further into the evening. So, a little bit uh, by way of introduction, um, that's why it says introduction. My name is Stuart Morris, I'm lecturer in entrepreneurship here at the university. I have no Nobel Prizes. I have one crazy hobby, that's the video that's running there, just uh, to give you a frame of reference for this person. Uh, two startups currently underway, I have had two businesses go bankrupt, I have five children, some of whom are here. Um, yeah, I felt I needed them to come, otherwise there might just have been three people in the room. Um, I am currently a director of eight companies. Um, I've been a magistrate here in the UK for 10 years. Now, for those of you not familiar with the legal system in the UK, the Americans have a concept of volunteer firefighters. In the UK, we have the concept of volunteer judges. So over the last 10 years, I have adjudicated on 3,500 cases. And I have been involved in 14 startups in the last 18 years. And this term, I'm teaching 230 students on a course called Practice of Entrepreneurship. Some of them are here. Um, okay, now they're trying to put me off. So, that's a little bit about me. I teach entrepreneurship, but I'm also a practical entrepreneur. So, you've arrived, and you've come for an hour of your life, which you hope will be profitable. Well, you were all given two pence on your way in. So you've, you're two pence up on the evening already. Although we will be doing an activity with that. And trust me, many of you will not leave with your tuppence. So, for the budding entrepreneur, what I hope in the next hour is to give you some encouragement, um, some war stories, some tips to remember, but primarily some belief in yourself that this is something worth doing. For the person who wants to change the world, the same. Because entrepreneurial spirit is not necessarily about running the next Facebook uh, or eBay or Google. Entrepreneurship is often about uh, changing the world in a very humble way. Um, for example, a couple of weeks ago I was in Istanbul teaching entrepreneurship to a bunch of um, Turkish journalists, which sounds like a bit of an odd one. Turkey has more journalists in prison than any other nation on the planet. Today there are 74 journalists in prison in Turkey simply for being journalists. And we were teaching people who have the courage not only to be journalists in that environment, but also are trying to start their own business and live by their journalism. And so they were never going to be wealthy, they were never going to make millions of pounds in that environment, but they are trying to change the world. And the entrepreneurial spirit is as much about charity, social enterprise, and profit as it is about anything else. And for those of you who are the friends and family of entrepreneurs, what I hope to give you is something of an understanding of the madness that grips the mind so that you might uh, look at them, perhaps with a little more pity than irritation. <clears throat> So, the first question, what is an entrepreneur? And um, I'm going to read a, a little section. Uh, the Lean Startup, a really excellent book in case you are seriously interested in starting your own business. Um, I've, uh, so, a little quick quote. A startup is a human institution designed to create a new product or service under conditions of extreme uncertainty. So for most of us, we try and live in a world where there is a degree of certainty. For the entrepreneur, <clears throat> we have to live in a world where there is uncertainty and often it's very extreme. So, what is an entrepreneur? <laughs> I, 
fortunately, this is a friend of mine. Um, <laughs> I should have done what I do to my students, which says, if you're going to be more than two minutes late, don't bother pitching up. Um, <clears throat> so, an entrepreneur is somebody who wants to create something. They may want to create something where there is nothing, so something completely new, or they may want to create something better than there is now. And I don't mind which definition you're using. How do entrepreneurs think? And the truth is, they think very differently from, in quotes, normal people, although there is something of it, of the entrepreneur in all of us. And for the next few slides, I'm going to go into uh, some theory, but in a light-hearted way, I hope. If there are questions, do please fire them out. Traditional business school teaching, and bear in mind, I teach in the Henley Business School, one of the top 1% of business schools in the planet, and it is a very traditional business school, teaches business in this way. To the extent that we can predict the future by using tools like market research, we can control it. So an MBA graduate looking at doing something new will spend an awful lot of time and money on research to try and understand what the future is likely to be. What research into entrepreneurs tells us is that they believe that to the extent that we can control the future, we do not need to predict it. And here I have a fine example, the iPhone. <laughs> but it's a good example of the point. When Apple created the iPhone, had they gone out and done market research and said to the public, do you want a phone with one button? The public would have said, no, we like our phones with buttons. Their courage was to bring out something dramatically new in the face of market research that would have told them not to. So actually, Steve Jobs famously didn't like doing market research. He thoroughly believed that he could control the future and therefore didn't need to predict it. And to a degree, given the success of Apple, he was right. As an aside, the little loudspeakers in iPhones and iPads, Apple is now the single largest manufacturer of loudspeakers on the planet. Just a bizarre, they've done more research into small design of loudspeakers than any other company. So we call the difference between these causation, if this, then that. Effectuation tends to be the way entrepreneurs think. So another one. The causal view of the world is on expected returns. So an investor investing in a business, if I put my £100,000 into this business, the investor is expecting in three, four, five, ten years' time to get five, ten, fifteen, twenty times his initial investment back. VCs, venture capitalists, when they're looking at funding an entrepreneurial startup, are looking at it purely in terms of how much am I going to get back later down the line. Entrepreneurs look much more at can I afford to lose the money we're investing? We're going to do this. What's the worst that can happen? Can I afford the worst that can happen? And this is a very, very common difference between the way MBA graduates think and uh, entrepreneurs think. Not necessarily, you have to dig quite hard before they'll admit that this is the how they think, but it is there. Again, the way large companies do business, competitive analyses. They delve into what their competitors are doing very, very hard in order to work out where they're going next. Entrepreneurs tend to be much more about doing alliances with people in order to bring in the resources they need to get the project off the ground. These are huge generalizations, but um, we certainly find them to be largely true. Again, large companies tend to think in terms of pre-existing knowledge. What do we know and what can we extrapolate from that? Startups 
and entrepreneurs tend to work on the exploitation uh, of contingencies. These guys are staff, so I'm going to forgive them. Um, so, let us do a quick example of the exploitation of contingencies. You've each been given a two pence coin. I've got a ten pence coin, I somehow have ended up without a two pence coin. What I would like you to do is find a partner, it can be the person sat next to you, but not yet, wait till I've given you the instructions, <laughs> and each toss your coin in the conventional and traditional manner. If you get two heads, do it again. If you get two tails, do it again. If you get head and a tail, whichever of you got the head gets both coins. Okay? So, what we will do is we'll end up, after the first round, half of you without a coin. Yes? Everybody clear on that? Any questions from the back there? No? Okay. Teachers have pets. What's less known is that teachers have nemeses. <laughs> and she's hiding. Anyway, um, what we'll then do is the winner from the first round needs to find another winner from the first round. So it's probably somebody sitting quite close to you at this point. And do it again. So after the second round, we should have three people sat down with no coins and one person, uh, every fourth person, now with four coins. Are you still with me? Right. I'm thinking we're going to be of the order of six or seven rounds. By the time we get five or six people still standing, we'll have them down the front for a playoff. Okay? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Hey, you win. Gary wins. So, apart from getting you all to work off a little bit of energy, uh, what was the point of that? Could Gary have won the chocolate had he not been here? No. Exploitation of contingencies. There was luck involved, but he had to turn up. And so much of business is being in the right place at the right time. Guys, stop playing with spare coins. <laughs> so much of business is being in the right place at the right time with your eyes open to take advantage of the opportunities that arise. Um, Carrie, yeah. I'm about to embarrass you, but I just thought I'd give you a moment's warning. <laughs> That's fine. Um, last year, we talked about, um, I was teaching about networking. Networking is a really, really useful skill that I don't have particularly well. I go to networking meetings, I meet lots of people, and then I forget who it is I've met. Carrie came up to me after a lecture one day and said, how do you do this networking thing? And I said, come to the next networking event. And she did and met loads of really interesting people. And she left that room with a big sheaf of business cards. Now, she turned up, she engaged in the activity despite being quite scared, is that a fair description? Okay, yeah, okay, you were absolutely petrified. <laughs> yeah. um, but she did, and she tried. And now she's got a group of contacts for placements, summer holiday jobs, perhaps even a job after finals, that she would never have had had she not stepped up in the first moment. Okay, that's my laptop complaining that the battery is um, dying. Um, so, sorry. <coughs> so, exploitation of contingencies is about seizing the moment, about being there, choosing to be there, and doing it. 
the coins example, I saw done at a meeting with 400 people in it, and we were all asked to bring our own pound coins. At the end of the exercise, somebody had a hat full of 400 pound coins. Did anyone else dip into their pocket and take another one out and have another gap? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? I reached into my first hat and I lost my first two people out. Exactly. Okay. Worth a try. Worth a try. Um, <laughs> and, and the boys at the back there have got about five pounds worth of 2p coins, so they could actually have flooded the market with uh, other things. So that's one of my first points. To exploitation of, of the stuff that happens. And we see this in places like Bangladesh. A village gets wiped out by a tsunami. The entrepreneurs are the people who the following morning are collecting up the bits of houses and selling it as firewood. Now that might seem harsh, but actually it's a survival instinct in human beings to make use of what we find after a disaster to stay alive. So, let's talk about risk. Many people describe entrepreneurs as a bloke standing on the top of a very large cliff preparing to jump off without a hang glider. Uh, and then jumping. There he goes. Now, Jeb's hope is that he can get up to 120 miles an hour, at which point his wingsuit will start flying before he hits the rocks. What he's doing at this point is hoping that he can fly between those two trees and a couple of balloons without hitting the trees. He's doing 120 miles an hour. Watch how close he is to this guy. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Even for me, this is a little too risky. <laughs> He then flies out over the valley and deploys his parachute. This is one of the most experienced uh, wingsuit flyers in the world. Let's watch another video of his. <laughs> this is Table Mountain. Oh! <laughs> oh that's gonna hurt. Yeah, both legs are now broken. Oh. He pulls his parachute and four seconds later hits the ground. He hit the ground doing well over 60 miles an hour. His parachute hadn't fully deployed. That is risk. Yes? Did he survive? He's fine, and he's jumping again. Which way round were the videos? They, they were in the order that I've shown you. But he's done the crack one, the first one. He was the first person to invent that particular maneuver on that mountain in Norway, and many people have done it since. Uh, table Mountain, um, he was just trying to see how low you can get over that ridge, and he got too low. That view of entrepreneurship is not real. I have had two businesses go bankrupt, one owing £3.3 .3 million. <sighs> <laughs> two of my friends and employees in that business, three of my friends and employees that are in that business, are in this room. It hurt a lot, guys, didn't it? Yes, not all around. But our hearts are still beating, our lungs are still breathing, and we did not break any bones. The point I'm trying to make is that the risk of the entrepreneurial life is real but it is not life-threatening. It isn't the same of throwing yourself off a mountain with a, with a wingsuit. And to that extent, be encouraged. What's the worst that can happen? Yes, it's horrible, but it isn't complete and total disaster. The other thing about the entrepreneurial life is that you don't have to start throwing yourself off a 3,000 foot high mountain. You can start jumping in puddles. <coughs> you can have the safety gear. I feel the, uh, the cars, Wellingtons, are absolutely essential at this point. And the beautiful thing about this little video is he makes mistakes. <laughs> but they don't hurt. But he learns 
that the edge is a dangerous place to be. So the entrepreneurial life does not have to be all or nothing. It does not have to be death or glory. And there are ways in which you can start a business that doesn't involve raising millions and millions of pounds of venture capital. You can start a business with next to nothing. And there are people in this room who started businesses with no more than a month's salary in the bank, if that, and who have made a living for many, many years onwards. It's not always comfortable, but it is doable. The other important thing is that you need to learn from your mistakes. And actually, as human beings, we learn much more from our mistakes than we do from our successes. Thomas Edison famously quoted after the sort of something like a thousandth failure of making a light bulb, why don't you just give up? I have not failed 999 times. I have simply found 999 ways of not making a light bulb. Um, James Dyson, with his bagless vacuum cleaner, something like 700 prototypes before he got a machine that actually worked the way he thought he could sell it. And every Dyson vacuum cleaner since has been a significant improvement on the early models because he's continued to innovate. The entrepreneurial life takes a lot of effort but our mistakes are what we learn from most. They are the things that propel us forwards. Right. So, are entrepreneurs adrenaline junkies? No. Most entrepreneurs believe that they can control the risks. Now, this is one for the friends and family of the entrepreneur. You're watching your loved one take what to you seems like an insane risk. And just like Jeb jumping off the cliff, he thinks his skill is going to be sufficient to do the task. The entrepreneur believes that they have thought of everything they can think of, they have minimised the risk to the level that they're prepared to, to, to accept, the affordable loss concept, and then they go for it. So now we're going to do another little exercise. Um, I need uh, a volunteer. Richard has hand up first. I have three vessels before us. You being first, you get the one you can see in. So we have um, orange chocolates and silver chocolates. I did say there was chocolates tonight. <laughs> and you can see in the glass that they're roughly 50-50. Distribution? I guess, yeah. Yeah. Your challenge, close your eyes, mm -hmm. predict whether you're going to get a silver or an orange. <laughs> okay. And then, with your eyes still closed, pull. Uh, orange. Yes. And for your... Uh, you get a born as well. Oh, okay. Do I have to no, 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 just, no, you just take the second one. Oh. See, sometimes entrepreneurship and luck is generous. <laughs> Thank you. Luck. <laughs> yeah, he was very, very carefully predicting where he was going. So, um, a second volunteer, please. Come on. I have a glass with chocolates in it. <laughs> What colour? Is it between silver and orange? What colour? <laughs> <laughs> um, pink? Close your eyes. Hands in. You just. <laughs> Actually, in this one, there are pink and silver, or orange or no, that's not silver, pink oh. and gold. So, and usually, when you run that one, people pick one of these two colours, because they can't see what's in this one. One more. <laughs> Come on then. Take a colour. Blue. Close your eyes. 
<laughs> Sorry, she got the blue one, so yeah, you may have another. Actually, let's be kind. You can have chocolate as well as the little thing there. Thanks. Okay, so what's the point here? We have, in a sense, three games. The first one is a game of prediction. You can see what's in the glass, you know what the options are, you can calculate the odds, and you predict which one you're going to pull out. The second one is a game of risk. You don't know what the odds are. In fact, the only thing you'll, you think you know is that there are chocolates in there. The final one is a game of uncertainty, because there are all sorts of random things in there, including a five pound note. <laughs> now I'd like to ask each of you which game would you prefer to play so hands up all the people who prefer to play a game of prediction okay interesting <laughs> hands up who quite like a game of risk yeah and how many a full-on uncertainty. A few, yeah. yes. <laughs> but roughly a third each, which is very interesting. Now, for those of you at work, which game do you think you're playing every day of your working life? How many of you feel that in your day job you're playing the game of uncertainty because you don't know what the rules are? John, a few of us? How many of you feel you're playing a game of risk, in a sense, with your employer? One or two? <laughs> okay, the lady over here is my wife, and she works for us in our family business. Working for me is pretty risky. Um, how many of you feel you're playing a game of prediction at your employer? Aren't you pay, playing all three at the same time? In many senses, Because you yes. don't, you, they're a mixture of everything in every day. Yes. Yeah. But it's interesting how we feel comfortable in, in one place or the other, and how those who are happy in this place are prepared to... I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the way you're there. So, on a question, and at the end you can all pull a chocolate. One of the most important things, and this took me years to learn, so I'm sharing it with you and in, after 35 minutes. What does success mean to you? There is no point in starting a business that is going to deliver a handful of coppers when what you want is the Aston Martin. If you look at your business model and it's simply not capable of delivering what you want, go start another business, because this one's not going to cut it for you. Is what you want the wildlife of Bollinger and parties? You need a business that's going to support that. The big corner office. Guys, did I not have a nice big corner office? Yes, they're all nodding at the back there. Is it the perfect landing after the perfect day's flying? Uh, this is me, by the way, after a perfect landing, after a perfect day's flight. Or is it watching a small child hold the first toy he or she has ever been given? And understanding what for you is the definition of success is absolutely vital. Let me tell you a little story about um, something we did in Moldova. Moldova is Europe's poorest country. It's a tiny little state about the size of, size of Wales, four, four and a half million people tucked away between Romania and the Ukraine. When they declared independence in, I think it was 91, uh, the Soviet Union, or the remains of the Soviet Union, turned off the oil, the gas, the electricity. The country went dark. Within three years of independence, 98% of the population were subsistence farming, uh, and they were on average, living on less than a dollar a day. It was an incredibly poor place. A friend of mine started a business there. It was the first uh, 
European or Western owned technology company in Moldova. I joined them in 2002. This business was started in 2000. In 2003, we had 135 employees. With those 135 employees, we were paying 4% of the nation's income tax. So it was a bit insane. We were feeding 3,500 people a day because each of those employees was paying the food bills for their entire extended families, the grandparents, all of the aunts and uncles, the entire extended family. For me, four years of my life flying to this little tiny country, I knew all of the air crew of Moldovan International Airlines by first name, all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, lifting that nation out of poverty became a bit of a mission. Today, the IT industry in Moldova has 40,000 employees and represents 10% of GDP. 39 out of the top 40 IT businesses in Moldova are led or managed by people that joined our company in the early 2000s and have now left and gone to grow the business. For me, that's success. That's a very personal view of success. I had a phone call last summer from one of my old friends. Stuart, I've got a new job. I need to thank you. And I'm thinking, why? I haven't spoken to you in five years. Why do you need to thank, thank me? What's the new job? I'm now the chief technology officer for the government of Moldova. And what you taught me about team leadership and quality back in 2002 is what got me this job. For me, that is success. But the other thing that is important about success is to know yourself and to know what will happen when the success goes up in flames. When my business went bust, when I had spent five years of my life with people in this room and had nothing to show for it, it was this quotation from Winston Churchill that got me back on my feet. I'm not going to re you read it at the back there. He said this in 1941, a particularly dark time in uh, European history. So that leads on to the quadruple bottom line. Any endeavor <laughs> must have a financial bottom line. This university has to have more money coming in than it has going out or it will cease to exist. A for-profit business must have more money coming in than going out or it will cease to exist. Your family, Save the Children as a charity, the Red Cross as a charity, all of these institutions must have more money coming in than going out or they cannot survive. The financial bottom line is vital for any endeavor. But so too is the social bottom line. And by that I mean, and let's use the example of the university, we have 22,000 students living in and around this campus. If they start kicking up a fuss and having too many loud parties, the switchboard lights up the following morning from concerned and irritated residents. We need the cooperation of the community in which we live in order to exist. Without their cooperation, we don't get planning permission for new buildings. We don't get to exist the way we want to exist. And a business or a charity is exactly the same. It must be, in a sense, blessing the community in which it exists. There must be a net positive. Otherwise, you simply become the pariah of your community and you will be opposed. Spiritual bottom line, it's always a dangerous word to use, but I'm a bit of a maverick, so I'm going to use it. What do I mean by that? Um, I'm going to use a really dangerous example, given that there are three of my ex-employees in the room. Do you remember the Christmas parties, chaps? Were they quite a lot of fun? Yes, thank you. Right, okay. Having, having gathered that, we used to shut the office between Christmas and New Year, and we used to get everybody's Xboxes and Playstations, and the biggest scale electric and train set you've ever seen, just build, put everybody's stuff together, and 
have fun together. What we were trying to do, and I won't ask them whether we were successful or not, is actually to not just feed the financial pockets of our employees, but to feed their hearts, to give them a <coughs> sense of fun. Because when I would phone up in the middle of the night and say, really sorry chaps, I'm in Alaska, I know it's quite late, but I need you to fix this bug for me, they would step up. If I was constantly driving them into the ground, I know I did, I'm sorry guys, um, the times I needed them to pull an all-nighter, they wouldn't have had it in them to deliver. So what I mean by this virtual bottom line is actually feeding the heart needs, not just the stomach needs, of your employees uh, as they exist around you. And indeed the spiritual needs. But also the environmental bottom line, and in a sense that one goes without saying these days. If you are strip mining coal from a mountain in Virginia by literally cutting the top off the mountain and working your way through the mountain, digging the coal out, guess what? You're going to run out of mountains, at which point you don't have a business. It's very, very simple. Uh, I was talking to a friend from Bahrain the other day. Bahrain has run out of oil. They've had to change their business model. They're now refining it for everybody else, but at some point that will stop too. So we have an island state that has got to reinvent itself from the ground up to stay alive because, fundamentally, they were running a business based on an environmentally limited resource. And the same is true in any other places. So, why are you doing this? Why do you go to work? Why are you starting your own business? Why are you even contemplating starting your own business? Because on their deathbed, nobody ever said, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. <laughs> I can promise you that one. So one of the questions you need to ask for yourself is, what is it you want to leave behind? What is the legacy that you want from the business? And how will your business get you there? And this comes down to a very interesting question. Are you a leader or a manager? And there is a very important difference. You need to know and understand yourself when you're running a business. If it's just you running your business, then you don't really need much by way of, um, of management skills. You can tell yourself to get up in the morning, you tell yourself to get on with it. Um, if there's a team of you, you're going to need somebody who can manage and somebody who can lead. You need to build your team to complement and not duplicate yourself. Steve Jobs famously uh, said that without Steve Wozniak, Apple would not have existed. Um, who's the other guy I was thinking of? Sorry, I was going to use a really succinct example there and it's just gone completely from my head. Richard Branson uh, often says, find the best people you can and hire them. Because he knows that he's not a marketing expert. He knows that he's not an HR expert. If you are going to try and hire lots of people like yourself into your business, you're going to run into the buffers. Your business will not carry on and expand. You need to have the courage to say, I can't do this. I need somebody else to come in and help me. And the final point, never ever give in. I will come back to that again. What is failure? I've spoken a bit about failure. I'm quite good at failure. I've done it very well for a number of years. Is insolvency or bankruptcy failure? Yes, a business might go bankrupt. One of my businesses went bankrupt. <laughs> there were mistakes we had made, but primarily we went bankrupt because of the international banking crisis. Our customers were banks. They stopped spending money. There was very little we could do about running off the end of a cliff at that point and running out of cash. Had we failed? In some ways, yes, but fundamentally, the business failed not because of anything we did, that we did our very best to keep it alive. 
is failure not delivering. How often have you ordered something from a company and they've not delivered what you ordered? That's failure, not delivering on the promise. <coughs> Giving in is my favourite one. Yeah, if you, if you give up, have you failed? But perhaps more importantly, not trying again when failure does happen. Pick yourself up. Your heart is still beating, your lungs are still breathing. Learn the lessons that need to be learned and get on with the next idea or the next business. But certainly not trying in the first place <coughs> is perhaps the biggest failure. To sit afraid and not go and try and do it. So here is a quote, quite a long one, so I will read this one out because at the back I'm guessing you're struggling. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails whilst daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Theodore Roosevelt in 1910. Uh, that comes from a much, much larger speech written in a very, very arcane form of English <coughs> only a century ago. It's still quite a hard read. This section is, show, is known as the man in the arena speech. You can Google it, it will come up. But the fundamental truth here, this last bit, if he fails, at least he fails whilst daring greatly so that his place will not be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Mm. If you are an entrepreneur, if you want to start your own business, do it. Get all the help you can get. Come to me if you're at the university. Find people around you who can support you. In Reading, we have a thing called the Family Business, a group of local entrepreneurs who get alongside other entrepreneurs and just encourage and mentor and help them to build their businesses. There is plenty of help. In fact, in the family business, we have a joke. We are a community of fellow sufferers. We are all in one way or another addicted to start up. So, to take away, and this is pretty much my last slide, the entrepreneurial attitude epitomized in Churchill's never give in. Very few entrepreneurs end up in their original line of business. Richard Branson started selling records from the back of a van. In fact, he didn't have any stock. What he did was put adverts in the back of NME, a magazine, saying, uh, tick which record you want to buy, send us your cheque, and we'll post it back to you. He then received the paper cutouts, because it was before the days of the internet, young people, and <laughs> banked the cheques, went to his local record shop and haggled, bought the album, he hoped, at less than he had just charged you for it, and posted it to you. He started that business for no more than the cost of a back page advert in a magazine. And where is he now? Trains? planes, not yet automobiles, <laughs> but only a relatively small part of Virgin's business is record sales. He has not ended up where he started. He also has a number of failures. Virgin Cola, does anybody remember Virgin Cola? <laughs> yeah? Coke put them out of business. It cost Coke three months of basically selling Coke at a penny a bottle to the supermarkets. But guess what? Supermarkets are fickle. If they can buy it for a penny a bottle from Coke or 30p a bottle from Virgin, who are they going to buy it from? That's exactly what happened. 
And finally, remember, and I say this acutely aware that my children, some of my children are in the room, business is not the first order of business on your agenda. You are. If your business is not feeding you, not just for your stomach, but in your heart, in your soul, you're in the wrong business. Your business needs to be supporting you. You are not its slave. And whilst changing career can be incredibly difficult and incredibly challenging, sometimes making the sensible decision is not giving in or giving up. It is making the sensible decision. And let me encourage you that sometimes being an entrepreneur and starting your own business is a sensible decision, especially for you undergraduates who are looking at a graduate recruitment market that is somewhat dodgy. We have two guys who tomorrow, uh, they, they were finalists this summer. They both got firsts from the systems engineering, so they're both geeks. I have been mentoring them over the last few months, and tomorrow a sales guy who's working for them on a commission-only basis is carrying two prototypes of their product to Los Angeles to go and demonstrate it to um, Beats by Dr. Dre. If they don't have a deal from that, which I would be very surprised, they will go and keep trying. But what they've done is looked at the entrepreneurial life and said, this is a lower risk strategy than trying to get a day job. And I'm all for it. Thank you very much.